general public depends on natural communities to provide ecosystem services, things clean up water to provide um, fresh air, etc. And coral reefs, like all natural communities, are degrading. But coral reefs probably more than most. And we would like for them to, for us to be able to back off and those reefs to recover. But humans are really not backing off. There's more of us. We're putting more stress on these systems. And so our research is trying to understand the intricate parts of how these work and what pieces we might be able to go in and proactively manipulate in order to uh, help reefs be more resilient and more healthy. Our research involves huge amounts of time on the bottom, doing a lot of fish observation and a lot of uh, large cage construction that takes a lot of bottom time. We simply wouldn't be able to do it without the bottom time that Aquarius provides. We can spend eight to nine hours a day outside working at about 60 feet deep where we have our cages and experiments. And from the surface, we can only get a few hours a day. So this, this makes this kind of experiment possible when it just wouldn't be otherwise. For people like me living underwater and, and having access to Aquarius is just spectacular. Um, even though I've done thousands of dives from the surface, I see things when I'm in Aquarius that I've never seen before. I see interactions that I've not seen before. I see phenomena I've not seen before. Maybe I don't see new species, but often I do. Um, we can go out um, in the afternoon and come back in at night. And so you get to see the whole change from day to night shift. You get to see the interactions that occur when, when light starts falling and the big predators come out and become more active. And so for us, it's, it's just spectacular to be able to spend that amount of time down there. Um, the food gets a little boring. Uh, we eat backpacking food primarily most of the time. Um, but other than that, you, you sleep well, um, you work hard, and you get to spend huge amounts of time underwater, which is what we love to do. Well, I'm, I'm going to lob the ball over to your side, and you either um, ask questions, or if uh, things slow down, I can do a little show and tell, either one, or both. Okay, we'll do that. Okay. We have, uh, we have a question from the audience. Just one moment while I get it from Dr. Anderson. Hang on. Sure. So the question is, uh, how many people live and work on Aquarius at any given time? I mean, how many are there right now, and what's the maximum capacity of, of the place? Well, uh, each time they do a mission, there are six people that live in Aquarius. There are two uh, professional diver technician types that keep us under control, and there are four scientists uh, that come down with us. To my knowledge, that's always what the mission team is. Um, there's enough bunks for six people. Um, I'm sure more people could live in here, but it, it would not be pretty. It's a, it's a fairly um, constrained space. Thank you. Uh, I have another question for you, which uh, sure. the people here may not be, uh, know, uh, because I know Mark, and I know what his voice sounds like, and I can tell you that his voice is sounding a little bit thoroughly right now. Can you explain what that's about? Um, when we're at about 50 feet deep, which means the air in here is about four times the density that it is in the room where you're sitting. Um, and so our vocal cords work a bit differently uh, under that pressure. Uh, and it makes the sound a little bit weird. We have never, I've never been sure whether it's the, the vocal cords or the way we hear it here. If you think we sound squirrely or chipmunky or, you know, go a little high sometime, then um, it, it's clearly the vocal cords as opposed to the ears. Okay, so the, ne the next question is uh, that, that you spend a long time, you mentioned it was a long-term mission, and so how long are we talking about and how much cumulative bottom time would it have been and, and would this have even been possible if you weren't doing it from a liveaboard habitat? Um, the kind of work we do, we spend um, eight or nine hours a day, or that's our goal, in the water at about 60 feet deep. And so from the surface without decompressing, we can spend about... 60 minutes and have to go back up and sit on the surface for a while and can come down for ever shorter intervals after that. 
uh, from here we can work either eight or nine, depending on how we juggle the time, hours a day at that depth. And so to get the bottom time to do the kind of experiments we're doing, um, Aquarius is a huge um, benefit for us. So four people simply couldn't do it from the surface um, without Aquarius. So, so the question is, if the menu gets boring when you're eating the same uh, meals ready to eat all the time, do you guys ever eat fish? <laughs> we, um, I, I think all of our freeze-dried food is uh, terrestrial animal products. Uh, I don't think we have any fish products. This is a... Um, um, a protected area and research only area here. There's about 70 or 80 big barracuda right up over us under the life support buoy. And I've always lobbied for being able to bring a fishing rod down and shoot a, a lure up through them, catch one and drag it back down. I just always wanted to fish on the bottom of the ocean. But uh, these guys have um, never seen the wisdom of my uh, insight there. And uh, given that it's a marine protected area, it's not the thing to do. So we haven't done that. It is a desire, but we haven't done it. Well, perhaps you could take a moment to tell us a little bit more specifically about the project that you're doing right now uh, and, uh, and any preliminary results that you might have learned so far and what that means for the health of coral reefs. Sure, I'd be glad to. How long is the delay between what I say here and what you're hearing? Do you have any idea on that there? It's about five to eight seconds. Okay. So, Dom, can we switch to the screen and and keep me on a voiceover? Okay. So, Dom, can we switch to the screen? Okay. There we go. Okay. So the the question we're really addressing down here is the role of biodiversity in keeping reefs working, and and I'm sure this audience would be appreciative of biodiversity and its role, but uh, it's common for people to say, well, one more, one less species, who cares? There's a lot of them out there. And so part of what we're looking at, the let's take the Caribbean as an example. When I started working here 30 years ago, there were about 60% cover of the bottom with corals. Now it's about 6% on average Caribbean-wide. So we've lost 90% of the coral cover in the last 30 years, say. So that's that's the equivalent of aspen disappearing from Colorado or pine trees from Georgia. Um, and so what we're asking here is what's the role of herbivorous fish in preventing uh, reefs, corals, from being replaced by seaweeds? And basically we want to know are all herbivores the same? Is it just we've overfished everything or do particular ones matter? And what's the role of diversity? And so much of uh, coral reef ecology has really been focused on the switch from um, corals to macrophytes or, or large algae on, on reefs. And we sort of think people have clumped those too much and talked about herbivores and seaweeds, but we think it's important to know which herbivores and which seaweeds. And so we've been involved both here and in Fiji in looking at which seaweeds most damage corals, which herbivores eat those seaweeds, what the chemical and structural defenses of the seaweeds are, et cetera, and sort of who matters and why. And, and to give you sort of a quick overview, I'm going to scan through a couple of things. Here's one example that I hope is up on the screen in, in an appropriate time format. The first year we did this, and this is the fourth year of this project, we looked at red band parrotfish on the left and ocean surgeonfish that you should see there on the right. They have different sorts of mouth parts, different sorts of digestive physiologies. And uh, the parrotfish have these big fused teeth and can scrape down into really hard substrates so they can sort of eat the McDonald's parking lot to get the grease out of it if need be. The surgeon fish are sort of little key sheeters. They're kind of wimps. They eat the, the filaments and little things off the reef. And so we built these large cages on the reef, 32 of these, and sort of made reefs with equal amounts of that particular parrotfish, that particular surgeon fish, or a mix of each. And so the, um, the experimental design is, is shown here with there's two fish in each cage, either 
two of species A, two of species B, or one of each, or nobody. And then there's a fifth treatment that's not shown that's just a normal reef without a cage over it. And then uh, in the four years we've done this, I'm showing just the species mixes that we've looked at. The first year, and I'll, I'll show you why this is a big deal in a second, it was this red band parrot and the ocean surgeon. The next year it was two parrots. The next year it was two surgeon fishes. And this year down at the bottom it's a uh, red band parrot and a stoplight parrot. That, and all of these we've chosen because we think they do similar or very different things. And, and just to give you, I'm going to skip that, to give you an, an idea quickly, um, the RR stands for two red bands, the SS for two surgeons, and RS for the mix of each. And you can see that the mix there uh, suppress seaweeds a lot more than either one alone. And in fact, the two surgeons uh, didn't do any more than excluding all fish in terms of suppressing seaweeds. If we look at what we found in the parrotfish cages, it was covered by these big red algae that are chemically defended, and the parrotfish won't eat them. If we looked in the surgeon fish only, it was these hard algae um, that are calcified, and the surgeon fish rely on acid-mediated digestion, and so if they eat these calcified things, it's sort of like throwing a Tom's tablet in a Coke bottle. It would just fizzy them up. Uh, but when we had the mix, we had just little turf-like algae and encrusting corallines, these sort of pink things on the rock there. And those encrusting corallines actually facilitate coral settlement and growth. And so if we look at what happened with the corals in those cages, and again, this RR, RS, SS is the, the two different species mixed in the middle, you'll see that for mortality, it dropped to zero for the mix, but there was sort of 10 to 20% mortality of the corals and the treatments with either fish alone. And if we look at growth instead of mortality, you see that uh, with the mixed species, we got 22% increase in coral cover. With uh, either species alone, we got declines as we did when all herbivores were excluded. So from that, you can see that the the diversity really matters. And so what's going on here, let me scan through. We did it a second year with some other fish and got similar results. But basically, uh, if you look at these three fish that we did it for in the first two years, if we take away the princess parrot, we get filamentous algae covering the reef. If we take away the surgeon fish, we get these big reds covering the reef and killing corals, and if we take away the red band, we get these big brown seaweeds covering the reef. If you put all three of them in, we get encrusting corallines and greater coral growth. So it really looks like that the, the diversity here is critical. It's not just that you have adequate mass of herbivores, but you have to have the right mix because they have different feeding strategies and can keep the seaweeds from doing in the corals. And uh, I'll, I'll stop droning on and open it for questions, and I'll, I'll actually cut this part off. And if people want to see just some pictures from down here, there's some of those available for later, but I'd be glad to just do questions as well. Well, that's, that's fascinating. Uh, it seems that the coral cover is an emergent property of diversity, and that seems like it's something greater than the sum of its parts. Is that really what you expected to find, or uh, what do you think the greater significance of this is? Well, we, we suspected that might be the case, but we weren't sure. You're never sure until you do this, and there are very few people that can have access to a facility like this and go out and, and do these kind of long-term manipulations underwater. In other words, those cages have all been maintained and stayed in place for 10 months out of the year to generate that. We can go do, and other people have done, behavioral things over the very short term, but it's... Um, these are the only kind of data that I'm aware about that really show that effect on coral reefs. And it's what we suspected at some level. Um, there's, there's a few differences that we thought would be big, that there's just no difference there much at all, and there's some others that we thought would be pretty similar, and they're strikingly different. So we've learned a great deal from doing this. 
I have a, a slightly different kind of question for you sure. now, uh, which is to relate uh, what you're doing on the Aquarius underwater habitat with what astronauts would do up in space, because it's an analogous kind of uh, uh, scientific activity, and I wondered if you had thought about aquanauts relative to astronauts and, and how you see the place of undersea research relative to uh, the tremendous public profile that, that uh, space research would have. Uh, well, there's there's a number of ways we can go with that. One, the uh, NASA actually uses this facility to train the astronauts because it is, uh, as you said, very similar to a spacewalk or something. You're you're in a um, capsule of sort. You're safe in here, and you're in a different environment when you're out, and you have to return to the capsule safely. In other words, we we will eventually get back to the surface, but it takes us about. 18 or 19 hours to slowly come back up. So we have to um, make sure we can maneuver in this environment and get back to this particular location each time. Um, if you mean, you know, how much is unknown in the ocean versus how much is unknown um, in space and the, the different sort of um, profile that that gets. I, I would argue that uh, people like me, what I say we do is we work on the cutting edge of ignorance, not the, not the forefront of science, but in other words, we're trying to beat back, you know, the, the dark edges of ignorance. We sort of hang our, our toes over the unknown and flail away hoping to find new things and, and open new areas. And uh, in, in 30 years of doing that, every time I go down, we find something new and exciting. So I am not the least bit worried about running out of cool things to do in my lifetime or my grandchildren's lifetime underwater. Um, huge amount of unknown. And, of course, you know, we work in primarily the shallower parts of it. There's... Uh, you know, the deepest parts of the ocean are higher than the highest mountains. So there's a lot down here that we don't know about. So the question relates specifically to the project that you're doing where you saw sort of the end products of species exclusion or inclusion in your enclosures. Uh, the question was more about have, is there a role for gut content analysis and looking at uh, whether you can show that actually those uh, individual species of fish are removing specific algae and having very specific impacts on the structure of that community. Yeah, and people have done some of that before. Our question was more, in other words, we can go out and watch what different species are eating, but in fact, what they like to eat most is what you never see them eat because it's all gone already. Um, so, in fact, when we exclude certain species from these reefs, we see seaweeds uh, bloom that in over 5,000 dives on reefs in the Caribbean, I have never seen those seaweeds on a coral reef. Um, they're coming in from the, the only place I've seen them before is a couple hundred feet deep or nearly 200 feet deep out on sand plains. And so the the direct observational stuff you can do fairly straightforward. Um, the longer term um, sort of making a reef that's that's composed of different species for longer periods of time, you get not only the direct effects but a whole series of cascading indirect effects um, that may be more important than the direct effects are. As, as the ecologists were finding that out, all the time now that um, there are a small number of direct effects, i.e. this, it diminishes, but there are thousands because there are so many species of indirect effects, and they sometimes obliterate or even reverse the magnitude of the direct effects. And so our, our goal was to set up communities and say, what if reefs were composed of these kind of species? What would happen over the longer term? Um, and unfortunately, those kind of experiments are being done on a grand scale all the time by us um, because we're fishing out species and, and polluting and removing things, but we're not doing it uh, in a controlled fashion. We're not doing it with replicates, and so we never know what the direct real effects are. Um, so this was a an attempt to set that up and say, if we um, wanted to go in and try to cure reefs, what are some ways that we could uh, try to do that? I'm, I'm particularly concerned that our goals in conservation are usually to say, if we back off, it'll cure itself. 
and I'm 59. There are nearly three times as many people on Earth as when I was born. We're quite clearly not backing off. And so I sort of uh, compare this to medicine. If if we had cancer and went to the doctor and he said, well, exercise a little more and eat better, um, that might be wise, but that's not enough. And so we're trying to um, learn enough about these interactions so that you could begin to sort of eco-engineer communities back to states of function. And I'm, I'm concerned that if we don't learn how to do that in the next 50 years, we'll be in real trouble. We clearly don't know how to do that now uh, very well, but if we don't try, um, I'm afraid we'll not advantage ourselves or natural systems. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I think that we're going to draw to a close at that point, um, but I really appreciate your time tonight. I know uh, you've got a busy scientific schedule there on the bottom of the ocean, and I want to thank you for taking the time out to talk to the AZA delegates to Georgia Aquarium's uh, social media following, uh, and to me personally, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Thank uh, you so much. No, no worries at all, and uh, goodbye from the real down under. <laughs> thank you. And thank hey, you, Dominic, bye. for helping us make it happen. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. No problem. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>